The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one holy and living God, amen. So a few years ago, I had occasion to, to preach about uh, my favorite lesson, one of my favorite lessons from seminary. It was, it was about the paradox of the altar. My favorite liturgics professor said, an altar is a table like any other table, and it's a table like no other table. Does it make sense? <laughs> In lots of ways, when we gather here around the altar, we're just kind of pulling up a chair like we would at anyone's dining room table. We're, we're sharing a meal, we're breaking bread together. So it's a table. It's a table like any other table. But what we know is that the meal that we share here is a meal like any other, it's not like any other meal. It's different. And we live in the tension of that paradox each week when we gather here at church. Episcopalians are good at living in that tension, living in that paradox. And it's because of the nature of how we approach the bread and wine as Episcopalians. See, we're, we're, the, we're the middle way. We're the both and. This is, a, this is Episcopalian 101, so if you're new today, this is, this is good. We, we're not just Catholic. And we're not just Protestant. I heard this morning that some people call us English Catholic, but even that doesn't really sum up exactly who we are because we're both. We're both Catholic and Protestant. And so a lot of that comes from our Eucharistic theology. And so to, to kind of put that together for you, so in Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, we are Catholic too, but in Roman Catholicism, the understanding is that it is the prayers that the priest says over the bread and wine that make the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Okay, it's the prayers that the priest says at the altar. In Protestantism, over here, the bread and the wine are symbols, purely symbols of the body and blood of Christ. Okay, so you can see there's two separate things happening. And Episcopalians, we walk what's called the via media, the middle way. Both and. So for us, it is both the prayers and the symbol. And what's, what's distinct about what we do as Episcopalians is that what makes it, what makes it the body and blood of Christ, 
is our consumption of it. When we come to the rail and we kneel down and we receive the bread and wine into our bodies, that is the moment when the mystery takes root in us. We become part of the body of Christ. So we live in that paradox. We are important to it, integral, we're, we're imperative really, to the body and blood of Christ becoming real in the world. Because when it becomes real in us, then we can take it out into the world and share it there. So we're talking about all of this because, as I promised last week, we're going to talk about bread today. And I'm going to talk about bread today because, <laughs> because this is part four of five weeks of bread gospels. We started July 29th, and then we've had three more weeks of bread, and next week is the last one. It's all, it's all of John's sixth chapter of his gospel. It's all about bread. He had a lot to say about bread. <laughs> and so we have to think about what that means and what it is to us. What, what is this bread, and, and what does it mean in terms of this paradox we live within as Episcopalians, as Christians, as followers of Jesus? Bread is common, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, as much as Jesus kind of talks about him being the flesh of the world, we luckily don't see, <laughs> we don't see that on the altar. We, we see that he makes, he, he compares himself to bread in all of these lessons. He's the bread of the, of the world that he's offering to the world, the bread of life that he's offering to the world. Bread is common. Bread is not just for those who can afford it. Bread is not just for the lofty. Bread is something that we all partake in, something we all have access to for the most part. Jesus asked us to all have that access. He, he wanted us all to be able to engage it and be a part of it. It's not, it's not just for a few, it's for all. And there's something so, so simple about that that it, it's, it's almost not even preachable because of its simplicity. Does that make sense? I, I could just say amen and go. <laughs> it's for you, go have it, amen. <laughs> but the, the joy of it is that the bread is for something. We were, we were uh, Bible studying this passage in staff meeting this week as we're wont to do and it was Kate, who uh, our youth minister, who said, I, I hate to be the one to point out the obvious, but, but we all need bread. We all need bread to live. And, and we all kind of went, uh, yeah. Yeah, we all need bread to live. We can't, we can't choose to not eat without there being the consequence of not living anymore. We all need bread to live. And so what if what Jesus is telling us is that we need him to live too? In the same way we have to partake of our daily bread as the Lord's Prayer tells us, we have to we have to partake of the things that nourish us in our soul as well so that we can continue to grow and continue to receive and, and continue to give out into the world. Nourishing happens in lots of different ways. Of course, we come here because we receive nourishment at our paradoxical altar. We, we come and we receive the bread and wine and it strengthens us to go out into the world. I don't know about you, but uh, some Sunday mornings are rough for me. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> I became more of one when I had a child, but, um, but it's not my favorite thing. So there are mornings when I struggle. I struggle to get here, and I, it's early, and, uh, and it's hard. It's hard to get here. And then all of a sudden, once I start being here and being in church with all of you, my energy just shoots through the roof. I get nurtured, I get nourished by our time that we get to spend here together, being at the altar, saying prayers together, and, and raising our voices in song. So, so that's one way. Weekly, we try to come here, you know, Episcopalians twice a month, right? <laughs> and so we, we try really hard to find those ways that, that nourish and nurture us. And we all have lots of different ways which is what's wonderful. And it doesn't have to be necessarily daily. Some things can nourish us for longer periods, sustain us for longer times. I, I just got back, some of you know, from having a retreat with my four best girlfriends from seminary. And th this was our second annual. Last year was our first time. After five years of being in parish ministry, we all realized we needed 
we needed to be together again. It's, it's strange to try and explain, but there are lots of times when people approach us as priests and say, now what is it exactly you do? <laughs> what, what, what do you do all day? How do you spend your time? And, and so to be with people who understand and have that same experience is so nourishing. It's so spiritual, and we all come from these diverse backgrounds. One's a school chaplain, and one's a rector, and, uh, and two of us are associate rectors, and, and we, we all have kind of this, this, these different diverse backgrounds, but we're all experiencing the same things, and so, and so we come together to be nourished by one another and, and to understand one another, to see and be seen by people who understand the language that we speak and understand what we give to one another and what we give to our parishes. It's one way that I get nourished. My husband, on the other hand, is off on retreat this weekend by himself. He's an introvert, and that, that to him is what feeds his soul. And he, he gets to spend time playing with his computers and all the things I don't understand. <laughs> and it feeds him. It nourishes him. And it means that I come home from my retreat and he comes home from his kind of retreat and we get to be stronger together. We get fed by those moments. We get nourished by those moments. So what are yours? What's the way that you get nourished in your life? For some here, we have this wonderful contemplative life program here. For some, it's coming to quiet days and being in silence. Those that, that are very good and, and enjoy that time of having silence. For some, it's the opposite end of the spectrum. Maybe it's going for a skydive and, and experiencing that full range of emotions that's God-given to us. There could be anything, any of those moments in which you feel connected, in which you feel alive and renewed and refreshed. All of them, all of those things are imperative to your spiritual life. Even the things that we don't think necessarily are, if they feed you, if they bring you joy, that's connecting you with Jesus. That's bread for you. And so we have to value it. So often the world tells us not to make time for ourselves and the things that we need and the things that we value. There's too much emphasis on you have to give, give, give to make yourself worthwhile. But if we don't give to ourselves, there's nothing to give back out, is there? So it's imperative that we all spend the time understanding what is it that feeds us? What is it that, that makes our nerves tingle with delight? Because those are the things we're called to by God. Those are the things that make us feel alive. And that's what God wants for us. God wants us to have that joy because what do we do when we feel joyful? We, we go share it with other people, don't we? When something wonderful happens, don't you call somebody and say, this amazing thing just happened and I'm so joyful about it. That is spreading the good news. Your good news comes from within. It comes from your soul. And so we nourish and nurture it. We nurture our souls because it's going to spread the good news out into the world. And when we spread that good news out into the world, what are we doing? We talked about it last week. We're building up the body of Christ. By receiving the body of Christ, the body and blood at these rails, these altars, we, we get nurtured. We take it into ourselves and offer it back out into the world. And that happens through just talking to people. That happens by serving our mission ministries. That happens in a million different ways. And your way is wonderful. There's no right or wrong to it. God made us diverse. God made us to have lots of different experiences. And so what feeds you and nurtures you is holy. It's holy bread. Make sure you make time for it in your lives. Honor it in your world. Help the people around you honor what's important to you and then honor what is important to them. It will make you stronger, which will make them stronger, and it will continue to grow so that the whole body of Christ whether they even realize they're a part of it yet or not, grows and grows and grows and strengthens for service and love of the light, the love of the light and the Lord. Amen.